Good morning. <laughs> so in much the same way that uh, we celebrate Christmas, it is tradition for the church to celebrate different aspects of Jesus' life and ministry with the coming of the new year. Over the past two weeks, uh, Pastor Jeremy has been preaching on Epiphany, um, which amounts to uh, celebrating the Magi coming to lay gifts at the feet of Jesus. And so there's other key stories and elements and history that we view uh, during this time, and one of those is the baptism of Christ. Um, in a few weeks, we're also going to talk about the transfiguration. Um, but today, we are going to look at the baptism of Christ, and I thought that I would do something slightly different from what I normally do, um, and so I sort of uh, compiled the accounts of Christ's baptism into one sermon. So if that it seems a little bit daunting, it's not actually as much <laughs> scripture as you think, but um, very uniquely all four of the Gospels give the account because it is, you know, one of the most significant <laughs> pinpoints because it's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, and so we're going to be jumping around from all four Gospels this morning. And I find that fitting because I think that helps us understand exactly what's happening um, when we view the baptism of Christ. So we're going to start in Mark 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Mark introduces his gospel by quoting from a scripture, reading, well, we didn't read this morning, but from the book of Isaiah, which is significant, meaning that the events that are about to take place are not entirely unforeseen. They've been predicted by the prophets in the Old Testament. Verse 4, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is one of the important ideas that we face this morning, so I want you to keep the idea of the repentance for the forgiveness of sins in mind as we continue. Repent, turn, confess your sins in word and deed, and receive forgiveness. Notably, people respond... <laughs> In a big way to this, in verse 5, And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized in him, the river Jordan, and confessing their sins. All the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going to him. It seems Israel was in a state of spiritual either revival or an acceptance that something new was happening. And so the nation is flocking to the Jordan River to repent and receive forgiveness. And the Jordan River is significant uh, for multiple reasons. The two most important ones, one, it's the closest body of water that, is, <laughs> that you can baptize people in to Jerusalem. But secondly, it has Old Testament significance. Because when Israel came to it and they were about to enter the Promised Land, Israel went through and was brought through the Jordan River. And at this point, we need to talk about baptism within the greater context of Scripture and where it comes from. Now, baptism as a practice comes from the Old Testament law and Levitical code for their purity ceremonies. It was customary for priests to wash themselves and clean themselves before performing their duties or entering the tabernacle. However, it also has some interesting links to other narratives within the storyline. And in this context, it is for the forgiveness of sins, <laughs> or the redemption, it has a very exciting uh, connection with the Exodus account, specifically the Red Sea. God parted the waters of the Red Sea to let Israel through and save them from the nation of Egypt. And in some sense, though this was a literal historical event, it symbolically presents an interesting image of salvation. Israel is literally brought from death to life, from bondage to new life with their Lord. God brings the people from slavery to freedom in him. Slavery is over. God is doing something new, though perhaps not entirely new, different to the people 
but not completely unforeseen. And despite this beginning, the nation is still required to follow after their Lord. And then the next link is for the next generation, as they're about to enter the promised land, they come through the Jordan and the waters are parted again. That takes on a very similar imagery. For the second time, the nation goes through the waters. And as the new nation enters the land that it is about to conquer in the book of Joshua, the separation of the waters represents a new generation being brought from death to life. They have just but to trust and follow the promises that God has made for them. Their wanderings are over. God is doing something different with his chosen nation. Despite this new beginning, the nation still needs to follow after their Lord. And baptism in the context that we're reading now in John, as John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan, is an individual baptism for those who want to symbolically be brought from death to life, confessing your sins as you go in and out of the water, being brought under the waters, symbolizing that the old you is left in the waters and new you rises to newness of life. For those who desire forgiveness for their sins, for those who desire to repent and change their actions, for those who desire to be brought from death to life. And though there is nothing special about the water itself, it symbolizes a change from slavery to life. Understandably, at the prospect of God doing something new or different, people flock to John the Baptist. And isn't that just like people do? When you hear that God is doing something new or different, might we all be wanting to get in on that? And some of us, for not the best possible reasons. Maybe perhaps because you want to be spared something. And the Gospel of Luke, in Luke 3, tells us about how John responded to this massive flocking of people coming from the nation. Luke 3, verse 7 says, he said, therefore, to the crowds that you came out, which to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Even tree there, every tree, therefore, does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. The baptism with the water is not <laughs> what saves these people, it is clear. And so, John notably, understanding that people tend to flock to avoid wrath and maybe improperly desire salvation, only to move from their baptism to continue their old ways this is acutely in John's mind. And John is notably the son of a Levite. Um, and so he exhibits what we would affectionately call in our teen discipleship class uh, the famous Levite temper or zealousness for the Lord, exhibited famously by such people as Moses or Phineas in the Old Testament. Here it is exhibited with the righteous fury of someone who can see the hypocrisy of others and recognize that they will continue in their old ways once being baptized and see that as a state of grace that they can continue to abuse. The significance of God's chosen people being called a brood of vipers should not be lost. People are a brood of vipers, snakes, or perhaps serpents is truly not lost on the audience. They are being crafty seeking perhaps only to avoid God's wrath. John's message at this point is fairly simple, and I think stands the test of time. Don't presume on who you know or who you are related to, and don't only say that you have repented to save yourself, but continue on in your ways. And so, at this outburst that John has towards the people at this message, the crowds ask him in verse 10, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. 
tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers likewise also asked him, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not exhort money or extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. Significantly, the gathering includes the common man, the tax collector, and the pagan soldier. Repent and receive forgiveness regardless of nationality or social class. Oddly, or to be expected, John doesn't say that the tax collector or the soldier should immediately change their vocation, but they should bear fruit in their vocation by exhibiting justice and fairness from within their vocation and social standing. Don't leverage the power that you have over other people. The whole message sounds eerily familiar to what Jesus will say on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to jump back to Mark for a second. Mark chapter 1, verse 6. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a, a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. The sentiment keys us in that this is reminiscent of the prophets who have come before John the Baptist, such as Elijah or Ezekiel, or any of the Old Testament prophets who lived in the wilderness and called out to Jerusalem for repentance. And finally we arrive at the heart of the sermon this morning. So please turn to John chapter 1, verses 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And he asked them, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, Now they had been sent by the Pharisees. The priests come out to ask under the authority of the Pharisees, On whose authority do you baptize people for the forgiveness of sins? You see, in both instances, well, really in all instances, in the Old Testament with the Red Sea and the Jordan, or the purification, it was all done under the authority of a Levite who was under the authority of God himself. First, out of Egypt through Moses under the authority and instruction of the Lord, and then through Joshua and the Levites via the presence of the Lord and the Ark for the crossing of the Jordan. So who is John? that he gets to do this. Well, he's the voice <laughs> of the Lord, and the crying out from the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord's. He's also a Levite. So their question is simple. Are you the Christ or the one promised? And John's words betray that he knows full well the scripture and his role to play in Christ's life. Surely his parents knew when the angel prophesied and have instructed him about his role to play. John chapter 1, verses 25. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. I am not he, but I prepare the way for him. As if the priests wouldn't have known what simply quoting from the passage of Isaiah was. They're looking to hear what John has to say about himself. And John, having already told them who he is, simply describes what his role is to be. John's purpose is clear. He will be the prophet, the priest, who will anoint the Christ, the King of Israel, through the waters of baptism. John's role is to proclaim Christ. Matthew chapter 3. Then, John, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. 
John would have, have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and, do not, and you do come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill, for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. In this we see the presence of each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Each member of the Trinity and John is there to bear witness at the start of Jesus' ministry. And just like in the Old Testament, under the word of a Levite, under the authority of the Lord, God starts something different, but not new. But something not entirely unforeseen. John understandably knows that his job is to proclaim Christ. He knows about Scripture, but evidently he could never have possibly imagined that he would be the one to baptize Christ. Or that Christ would even need to be baptized. Matthew states earlier in this account, in chapter 3, verse 6, that those who were being baptized confessed their sins in the water as they went and as they came out of the water. However, Christ immediately leaves the water upon his bathtub. Christ has no sins to confess. This raises the question, why does Jesus need to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness? Remember two things. Baptism is a symbolic moving from death to life, symbolically cleansing your old life from your new life. The old has gone, the new has come. The old you symbolically dies in the water, and the new you rises from the water symbolically, stepping into the new thing that God is doing. Jesus' baptism, since he has no sins or to leave behind in the waters, marks the start of his ministry. And just like Israel and Egypt and entering the Promised Land, God is doing something different in Christ. There's a new thing happening. So why would Jesus need to do this if he was sinless, blameless? He has no sins cleansing. Every act in the life of Christ atones for our sins, and the baptism is no different. Christ sets the example for us and how we ought to live. As Christ goes into the waters, we today go into the waters. We identify with Christ in that way. We recognize that God is doing something new in our lives. And so because of this, we are baptized and symbolically leave our old life behind us and step into the new life into the body of Christ. John will say in chapter 1, The next day when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After he comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing, that he might be revealed to Israel. To fulfill all righteousness. To set our example for us. I personally find it very interesting that John proclaims to his audience that they should not depend on their birthright for Abraham to save them, but to bear fruit in keeping with their change of character from death to life. In much the same way, he tells the people to not presume upon who they know. Christ himself does not presume upon who he knows, but goes to be baptized to fulfill righteousness. And this sounds very similar to passages like Philippians 2, where it says, He did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself to take the form of a servant. In much the same way as communion, there is nothing inherently special about the waters of baptism other than the symbolic identification with Christ and what he did. Indeed, the very fact that Christ has no sin to forgive us tells us that there's nothing special about the waters, other than an outward proclamation that an inward transformation has been made. God has done something new in you, so be baptized as Christ was baptized. The symbolic identification with Christ for the forgiveness of sins from death to life to bear fruit in keeping with your repentance and change of character, to fulfill all righteousness. 
And just like that, the ministry of Christ begins for the forgiveness of sins, to take away the sins of the world, to atone for deliberate and incidental sins, and to ultimately live a sinless life, go to the cross for salvation, and after three days be raised again and pave the way for his church. Paul views the baptism of Christ as symbolic for Christ's death and resurrection. Uniquely, he has very similar things to say that John has to say. Rather than just tell you about it, I'm going to read it for you. (laughs) In Romans 6, Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And as as if, if that was not a very beautiful and appropriate place to stop, Paul goes on. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present yourself, your members to sin as an instrument for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. And he will go on to say, Do not presume upon your grace. Now that you have been saved from your self, from your sins, don't presume upon the grace that you have been given. By no means. And this is the main takeaway that John preaches. It's not about who you know. Don't let sin reign, but bear fruit in keeping with your repentance. I think that is the main takeaway for us today. Don't presume that you will be saved just because you know that Christ was a historical person. James says even the demons believe in God and they shudder. But know him. Believe in your heart that he did these things for you. Repent and confess your sins and seek to be like Christ in keeping with repentance that you've shown. What does that look like? Well, that looks like obeying Christ and his commandments and following God's word in the here and now on this earth. (laughs) If you believe in your heart and profess that Christ is who he says he is here and now, you're a member of the body of Christ. Don't allow yourself to continue sinning, but bear fruit in keeping with your repentance. What you do and say, whether you realize it or not, in your everyday life, tells the world outside who Christ is. And so we ought to be like Christ and show Christ to the world around us. In Luke chapter 3, as we read, when the crowds are asking, John, what should we do then? They answered him, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors, collect no more money than you are authorized to. Do not exhort money from anyone who threats for the soldiers, or by false accusation, and be content. In short, seek the kingdom of God here and now. 
Seek shalom here and now. Seek justice now, dear fairly. Share with those who have nothing, and don't lie about others or accuse them. Don't take things from others for yourself, for selfish gain. You know, sometimes, and I'm fairly guilty of this, we get caught up in the idea that the kingdom of God is coming with the new creation. And so we get so laser-focused on how I wish that we would just go see Jesus right now. All our sorrows will be taken away, all the pain, and that's a good thing. We should desire strongly for Christ to come back and to bring us to him, to make the world new. But very often, we forget about the here and now. God's kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand, is what Jesus proclaims as he goes through. God's kingdom, through his church, is happening now just as much as it will happen later. And so how we live our lives now ought to be a reflection of the future time when Christ will be reigning on the earth physically. The church is the body of Christ, after all. And so because we are the body of Christ, we are called to a specific way of living that John very beautifully outlines in this passage. We are to live as though we are on the other side of the new creation. We are to live this in the here and now. And sometimes, as I said, we get so stuck on I want that that we forget about what's happening now. To live as Christ. Seeking the kingdom of God in our everyday lives. So don't pretend that we became believers, repented, and got baptized just so that we could occupy a seat and wait for Jesus to come back. Because we are the body of Christ, and what we do is a reflection of him. So we ought to live as though we are already with Christ, because we are. So bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Read the word of God. Follow his teachings and instructions because the kingdom of God is at hand now. Live as though we are already part of the new creation. Will you pray with me? Father God, I know that so often we are tempted to fall back into our own patterns. Christ has set a very clear example for us in how we ought to live our lives and Because we're sinful and we carry around this nature, we long for a time when that's gone and we can just be with you, Father, completely. For you will reign earthly and bodily and physically, Father. But you have called us to a specific plan now. You have called us to do battle and fight against our desires and our sinful intentions, Father. To at any cost live a life that is the life that you would have us. God, I pray that as we go from here today, you would continue to grow us closer to you, to let us know that we don't have to have all the answers. We are just to seek you and your kingdom in the here and now, and to reflect you, to continue to grow in our knowledge of your word, Father, and to love you with all that we are, so that we might love others around us with the same love that you loved us. And so ultimately, Father, we thank you for your character, your kindness, and for the forgiveness of sins, Father, and for the opportunity that you have given us to live out everything that you have commanded us to live out for you, Father, and for your body, and for the betterment of the world around us, Father, in the here and now. I ask that you would continue to grow us closer to you. In your son's name, amen.